Hi, everyone, and welcome to the MLOps Live webinar series, the series that explores how to get your data science to production from all different angles. My name is Sahar, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Iguazio. Before we start, I'd like to invite you to join over 300 MLOps and data science practitioners on our growing MLOps Live community. That way, we can continue the conversation after the session. We'll drop the link in the chat box now. Today, we're going to be joined by our good friends at Microsoft for a discussion about the main challenges around handling data for machine learning, automation and governance of AI, and some cool new technologies that provide solutions to these challenges. So to lead us through these topics today, we're delighted to have with us Kate Rosenshine, Global Cloud Solution Architecture Lead, Unicorns and Scale-Ups at Microsoft, Alessandro Racino, Global Data and AI Cloud Solution Architect, Unicorns at Microsoft, and Yaron Haviv, co-founder and CTO at Iguazio. Together, Kate, Alessandro, and Yaron will be addressing automation and governance of machine learning over production data. They'll touch upon feature stores, model monitoring, and setting up feedback loops, and finish off with a live demo. I will now pass things over to your own to kick us off. Thank you, Zar. Uh, hope you hear me okay. Uh, so with that, again, thanks for the Microsoft team for joining us. Uh, what we're going to focus today is how to integrate operational data, live data from production from your uh, you know, uh, ongoing business activities into a machine learning pipeline and, uh, and use uh, some of the Microsoft tools combined with what uh, we're providing in order to do so. So we, we've talked in the past about some of the key challenges of machine learning. And uh, if we look at that and sort of uh, some of it is relates to having different silos for data engineering, data science, and so on. Uh, the long process of delivering something to production, having to, to build you know, sort of pipelines and automation, data gathering, security, and so on. Uh, but one of the, the key features is how to access features. So when we, we do training, we do machine learning, then someone managed to grab some CSV files from some place, uh, maybe for another place. It's a pretty manual process. And as we, we build and train based on those uh, data sets that may be too small for, for training or may not be up to date, at some point we want to create a more automated pipeline and sort of take features that are really features from the business, like think of, transaction that's coming from the actual uh, operational databases or data warehouses or transaction logs from our web activities. So those are the, some of the main challenges of how to integrate such data, such active data, operational data into our machine learning pipeline and doing training and sometimes actually retraining our models every time the data uh, keeps on changing. And finally, there's the model accuracy, which we'll touch upon, but the main focus of today's event is about how to access features from production data sets in our machine learning pipelines. So data is, is essentially the, one of the biggest challenges today in machine learning, especially as we move forward with the auto ML and the aspects of choosing the algorithm and tuning the right parameters for the algorithm is becoming more and more an automated problem. The biggest problems people have is how to bring data and prepare that so our training Will, um, will essentially run to the, the best accuracy and will have the most variety of features that help us uh, get the, the best target results. And data integration is one of the main challenges and it appears in every segment of our machine learning pipeline, whether it's gathering the pipeline, preparing, gathering, gathering the data from the different sources, uh, preparing the data at scale, uh, then feeding that data into our training and, and serving model serving and, and also addressing the aspects of how do we serve data into our uh, model inferencing layer. And then we have to gather additional data from production and turn that data into uh, more meaningful data that we can track our model accuracy, explain the result during an af afterthought, et cetera. So that's the biggest challenge. And we're going to talk about some ways of addressing them. So what does it mean feature engineering or preparing features? So we have lots of raw data. You know, we have information about transactions, customer information, and what we need to, to do is turn it into meaningful data. You know, we have a date in a transaction, 
what can we do with that date? Can we train on a date value? No, we can't really train on a date value. But for example, we can train on a value which is time of day. You know, we know that morning hours are something that maybe people buy more, I don't know, cereals, or eat cereals, and the evening they may go to dinner. Okay. So we can translate some features that have numeric values or you know, string values or may need to be aggregated to go over a window of time and so on. We need to transform a set of features that are coming from the production data into uh, meaningful features. Sometimes we may have analytic tools doing that, especially features that are very oriented towards analytics, you know, like grouping and aggregates and joins. Some, some transformations are more type of data science transformation, more from the statistical angle, like imputing, one and encoding, or some other machine learning oriented transformations. Even NLP is sort of a transformation. We can take a piece of text and run some sentiment analysis or entity extraction on a piece of text and turn it into an, another feature, which is the sentiment of that text. So we, think we need to take raw data. We need to transform the, the features into something slightly more meaningful. We need to catalog those features along with their metadata, with their statistic, with their lineage and all that, and feed that data into the different elements in the machine learning pipeline, the training, <clears throat> the serving, which are obvious, but also the governance. So what we're going to see is how we can build that pipeline combining analytic tools like data, uh, like Synapse Analytics from Azure and, and using uh, our feature store, an open source feature store, and as well as the looking at the rest of the pipeline and how to attach that uh, feature, those features that we created with into machine learning services, whether we're running on our notebook or using a uh, managed service like Azure ML. So we're going to look into that workflow. So again, one of the key challenges today is that you have three different pipelines. We have the resource pipeline where we throw everything into a data lake. In many cases, the data is pretty old. It's not up to date. And we have ETL processes of bringing that data into the data lake. Then we need to do all sorts of batch transformations on that data, usually led by the data engineering team. Then data scientists will grab that data, do some additional transformation and train the models and so on. Once we finish that process, we now need to build another separate pipeline for the operational deployment, which is a, another pipeline that actually feeds from operational databases, up-to-date information, streams, events, and so on, run online transformation on that, store the results in sort of a more of an interactive database or key value store, and serve the model. And as we finish that, we have a third pipeline of governance. So we need to collect all the telemetry data, all the information from the production environment, feed it and do so, sort of anomaly detection, act, you know, model accuracy analysis, drift analysis, and so on, and store the same data for doing things like explainability, uh, governance, and so on. So we have three different pipelines. That's quite a tedious job to manage all of those. And there are many issues. We, we don't really have collaboration across teams. It's very long uh, pro process. We lose accuracy uh, in that uh, process and so on. So one of the things that we're uh, addressing is, and we're going to demonstrate that here, is that ha Azure has a, a new service, which is pretty cool. Uh, this allows you to connect to almost any type of data, not just Azure data, but you can also grab data from Google, from Amazon, from open source tools from production data warehouses and so on. So, and, uh, and Alexandra and Kate are going to speak about it in more details. You can collect all that data. You can run some data analytics transformations on top of that data. And once it's sort of, uh, ready, you can feed it into the feature store, which is going to catalog it, do some additional machine learning oriented transformation on the data, index it in random and a batch orientation so you can use it for training, for serving, and for uh, governance, and feeding it into the rest of the machine learning pipeline. So what we're going to look at is how do we uh, create data from, take data from any operational data source. Uh, we transform that data into something that could be used in a machine learning pipeline, do some additional feature engineering on that, and feed it into all the different elements of the pipeline. Now, it's not only one direction, but it's also the second direction as well. We can also take data back from the production 
store it in uh, like Azure Blob Store and, and use Data Synapse to doing governance policies and explainability and so on and different things that we need to, to do with this result data from production. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over to Alejandro. Okay, and I will now pass it over to Alessandro for the next portion. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kate Rosenshine, um, and Alessandro, I promise, is here with us as well. Um, so Johan covered some of the opportunities and some of um, what, you know, what, what is possible with data, especially as we've seen the rise in the data scientist, data engineer, data ops function across organizations. Um, but what we've observed that there's still some barriers uh, for organizations to actually get value from data. Um, so these are a few sort of five examples of, of what we've seen uh, through our work with customers, both large and small. Um, and I think the one that is um, that resonates the most is the data silos as well as the rising costs. So ultimately there is a cost of storing data um, to organizations. I think there was a lot of hype data is the new oil, you know, you're going to collect it, but then um, you're not actually going to get value from it. So it did, you know, there are rising costs associated with that. But then on the other hand, there are a lot of data silos within organizations. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping this is something that many of you on the on this webinar might be able to relate to. Um, I'm not hoping, I'm just hoping that, you know, this is a consistent pattern we've seen across the board. Um, and really the big change is going to come with how do you actually overcome that, especially when you are in an environment where some of those silos um, are there for a reason, perhaps this is because of governance or some sort of perceived risk. Um, so this is a very typical conversation that we've had, um, like I said, across many organizations, uh, large and small, there is a debate around data ownership, um, who owns it, what you're going to do with it. And what happens is the data sort of stays in the middle. Nobody actually does anything with it. Um, and at least it's protected, right? <laughs> um, so moving on to the next part, Alessandro is going to, he, I promise he's here. He's going to speak a bit about um, some of the, uh, or some of the solutions um, in the context of Azure um that we've we've observed that companies sort of use to start to tackle some of these challenges i'd love to say the world is perfect but i think it's going in a in a better direction um, so i uh, as uh, both um your own and, and kate already mentioned uh, there are a number of uh, um things that came out uh, over um how do you create an end-to-end -end analytics uh, uh, pipeline and you know up to the machine learning and what are the, the the challenges to put that in production so one of the the key point uh, that um, came out literally over the years is that there is uh, um at the enterprise scale level a number uh, of a variety of data sources so one of the, the, the first things is that very different type of data, different type of storage. And then ultimately, what are the computational engine that came out to um, be the most popular and most uh, used and adapted in, in the industry being normally those for the analytics, uh, either the SQL type of analytics uh, or the Spark, which are definitely the one to take um, over the um, market at the moment and they're most used uh, in general. So um, one of the, the key point is first uh, to have uh, some sort of a central place where regardless of the type of uh, storage and uh, uh, common uh, polyglot persistent type of approach, um, you can put any type of data and ideally those data are going to be uh, closest to their original nature. So whether it is in a structured data or structured data, they could sit on different type of storage. So it's very common to see the 
concept around this data lake store storage and in um, from our perspective in Azure, we built up this data lake storage, uh, which is leisurely a uh, file system that allows to have both endpoints, whether this is the blob storage nature or the file storage nature. And then a central platform for the um, engine on the computation. And we can keep uh, the clicking on the slide so that we can show uh, up to the end um, the, the two engine which uh, I was referring before, whether this is the Apache Spark or the SQL, and then building an entire ecosystem around, uh, which is able to integrate uh, with all the other platform and all the other languages that are commonly used. Um, the other key point is to that we see around uh, um, the uh, usage of analytics uh, and the um, application of uh, advanced analytics in the field is that there are personas that are more um, interested on having uh, an explorer uh, of the data, see if there is uh, some type of transformation that can be quickly um, applied, but ultimately trying to profile an end-to-end -end result uh, without actually having to worry uh, about the underlying infrastructure. And so that what brought um, us to um, consider two different types of approach, whether you have a dedicated type of infrastructure where you actually have to allocate uh, a cluster. Now, it doesn't matter if this is a SQL cluster or a Spark cluster or any type of computational one, or a serverless type of architecture where you can actually run and explore your data without worrying what, what is on the back. And then have a common uh, layer, which is the, the, the studio, which is actually a landing page. And we can move to, to the next slides where we um, basically can go and uh, look at all the place, that's the game, um, all the pipeline that goes from ingest, explore and analyze and visualize. And the common um, factors are that when you're looking at to make analytics, one of the complicated things is to actually get um, an automated and simplified pipeline. So the end-to-end -end is actually kind of where the, uh, we see people spending uh, most of the time. So whether this is doing an initial exploration of the data, dealing with files that or data that are different structure, um, whether it's a JSON or CSV or, or uh, Parquet, which is very common, or other type uh, like Avro or Orc, at the end of the day is the always almost uh, um, getting the data from their row to the point that they had they um, are transformed to meaningful insight is actually kind of a, um, where the people spend the majority of the time. And that's why having a, like uh, some simplified platform that can bring uh, this to live um, could actually help into the process. Can we move to the next slide? So one of the things I mentioned uh, at the beginning was regardless of uh, what is uh, the nature of the data, um, we could easily see that what is required is almost always uh, um, some type of uh, um, file data or table over the, the, the files that are compatible uh, commonly either with Spark or Hive, which are the most used. But, um, and, and then the other part is obviously um, the SQL, the, the SQL type of table. But at the end of the day, in many of these cases, and we can see what we saw is on the left side of the picture is like pool, and we'll show this into the uh, demo. Uh, reality is those are, could be represented as a table, even if uh, physically are still uh, laying on uh, the file system. And this is actually the possibility to mix these type of sources without having to necessarily move them around or re, um, wrangle uh, the data actually does allow for shorten the 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 end-to-end -end pipeline as i mentioned before and then there are the, there is the possibility to link other type of services uh, and other type of uh, um, 
computation and storage uh, in the form of uh, NoSQL or type of uh, log streaming and things like that. Uh, next, next slide. Um, so what I'm going to show later on, uh, together with your own, we'll go through the um, demo is uh, this platform and we'll see some of this concept uh, and I'll explain better. Um, but the, the bottom line is uh, we'll see the concept of the hub where we um, can look at our data, regardless of this data, if they sit into a table uh, inside a SQL or into a file and then a number of uh, possibility to access and profile this data quickly. Um, next, okay. Um, and then there is uh, the, um, I, I said at the beginning, we mentioned before that one of the point is uh, how many different sources and services are out there. So I'll show that there is uh, um, the possibility to, kind of leverage a number of uh, uh, pre-built uh, connectors that uh, uh, are already there. Um, and then there are a number of the like um, usual uh, uh, standard uh, sources, whether this is our uh, API type or ODBC. And so we can move to the next slide again. Once the data uh, have been uh, um, explored and profiled quickly, one other mm, key element is always uh, uh, go and manipulate the data to see if there is a um, you know, kind of a type of uh, um, wrangle that has to be done, whether to remove uh, data that are not useful, whether it's to replace the data with the other value, whether it's to format or convert the data in another type. And the type of approach, it's always uh, um, either through code and uh, um, using the usual languages, uh, whether this is Scala or Python um, or SQL again, or an approach that is more um, like low code or code free. And that's kind of the things we've done in this platform. We gave the possibility to have all of the approaches. So, and, and I'll show this during the demo, but is it either going simply through a data flow, which is a block wrangler that is gonna allow to uh, manipulate the data at least for the most common type of manipulation, but it's join the right column conditions, split look up, those type of things, filter, um, or using uh, the, the code and to uh, do this through either scripts or uh, using uh, notebooks. So here is the um, familiar interface that I was showing uh, uh, through the slides before. And uh, as uh, I mentioned, that's the studio, which is the landing uh, page where we can see um, the initial access to all the browsers from the ingest to the explore to the visualize. Um, and uh, on the left side, uh, um, we can see the storage and the data hub that I was mentioning, whether this is actually presented through what it looks like uh, um, a SQL type of database uh, with classical tables, uh, whether this is actually a spark pool, which in this case is re represented as a table over the files, or whether this is actually a storage, as I was mentioning before, which is uh, um, the data lake storage. It can be a classical blob storage or an Azure data lake storage, which as I said, uh, is gonna include both type of endpoints, the blob storage for the blob, but also the hierarchy type for um, the file system type. Um, one of the things is that I mentioned before, it's actually very easy to go and without having to move the data to navigate through the data lake storage where the file are sitting and pick up one of the files that could be um, a CSV file, could be a parquet file, and quickly go and explore the file to see what is the nature of the data. So 
this is actually running a, um, a SQL type of query, but obviously it's using an open row set. So I'm accessing the workhead file directly, although it's obviously going to look like a table and like I'm accessing a SQL table. Um, the same things could have been potentially done through a Spark type of approach where um, if I ask to load the data frame, will be given the code for, in this case, PySpark can decide to rewrite the core code in different uh, languages, whether it's SQL, Spark, C Sharp, or Scala. And if I'm going to run this, this is going to start the, the Spark session and it's going to go through the data in the same way. And this is one way to access the data without actually having to move the data between one engine and the other. Um, the other things is that those are not only for actually profiling the data, but I could go ahead and look at the data and start to do some initial type of cleaning or aggregation or looking at the schema to have the more meaningful type of uh, um, data results before I'm going to actually do uh, and pass it uh, back to the lake where can your own show after being picked up, pick it up and pass to um, the feature store, you know, do all the, the feature extraction and pass it to the algorithm. Um, so in the hub on the left side, I have the developer part where I can see all the type of uh, code that can be run to explore the data. And in this case, I could see that I can go through the same file as I did before. Uh, after that, I could easily start writing in PySpark, print the schema to see what is the structure, import. Uh, uh, SQL type of PySpark so that I can run uh, SQL type query, although I'm using a Spark engine, and start making some aggregation. In this case, look at my profit amount, um, group through the quantity. And the same could actually be that all of a sudden, I want to mix this data we we're saying at the, be at the beginning from dif with different type of data. I'm going to pick up here the data frame and load it through Spark, accessing it directly a JSON file. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm accessing the container on the data lake. So I'm actually picking up, as I showed before, uh, the data directly from here. The only difference is I'm actually picking up a different type of data. and in this packet, I have different type of structures. So in this case, I'm picking up a JSON file. Um, one, so I'm going to back is I can load this data. And then on top of that, again, I can act exactly as I would do uh, in Spark and create a, a pseudo view on top of that, and then start using the SQL magic so I can run SQL query this is exactly the same that you would run in any notebook and the engine behind that is serving the, 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 the Spark pool is actually the open source Apache uh, Spark engine. And for example, in this case, I'm picking up my JSON file. And if I'm going to look at this, this is actually not really readable, obviously, because it's a, uh, multiple nested. So again, I'm using PySpark. I can easily use the embedded function to explode that and easily flatten that type of thing. So explode that um, hierarchy for the top product purchase. And so then pass it to the alias and easily have now a table. And then on the next step, I can go ahead and kind of flat over the item purchase uh, for the last 12 months. This is an easy way to show the manipulation that I've done, but basically all this manipulation has been done without moving the data. And uh, when I say without moving the data is obviously there are uh, situations where 
we want to move the data um, and we want to wrangle the data. And I mentioned during uh, the um, presentation that part of this can be easily done through data flow, which is more uh, uh, no or low code or no code approach. In that case, uh, when I'm creating a data flow, what actually I'm doing is uh, picking up from a source, passing a data set, and all of this is done through uh, wrapping block graphical without actually having to necessarily uh, code anything, right? This is, I would go for creating a new, and here I can see all the many connectors that we mentioned from all type and all type of sources that we mentioned before. Uh, once the um, source has been picked up, I can do transformation, simple transformation, mapping the data, join, selecting the data, and write back ultimately on uh, a source that can I can decide that can be either my sign up set and in terms of uh, a SQL table, my synapse in terms of file, and then I can build again uh, Hive or Spark table uh, on top of that. So in that case, after all the transformation, I put back the data into the store so that the data have been formatted and I pass the fact sets back into the lake so that then your own can show how to pick that up and do the rest. So uh, you know, at this point, uh, I'm gonna pass the uh, presentation to you. Okay, so anyway, I think that the key thing here is with all those 90 connectors that cover probably almost any type of data source there is today, or like 90 something percent of those, that means that you can essentially create a data, uh, you know, ingestion and preparation uh, pipeline for all of your operational data. And then you can lend it as a parquet file or as a, as a stream in the case of more active data, and, and then pick it up from there to the machine learning pipeline without manually having to integrate with each individual data sources. Um, and I think that's the great value of, of this. Uh, so what we what we talked about is Azure Synapse is going to bring us all the data from all the different sources, uh, do some uh, analytics on that, and push it into a feature store. And then from the feature store, we're going to use it without any ad additional code. We're essentially going to use it for our training pipeline, our model serving pipeline, and our uh, governance. So that with that, let's move into uh, my demo. So. Uh, we, we're starting off, we're going to use ML run and, and use some imports, uh, create a, a project environment. That essentially, everything we do will be in sort of a, a context of a project. Um, let me increase. And now as a data scientist, you may want to do some additional things on the data that are more data science oriented, like uh, we we have this uh, data set that uh, Alejandro just uh, mentioned, and we may want to do things like uh, one-on-one encoding and scaling, and you know maybe some other uh, manipulation. So we we can just go and define those manipulations as sort of a, a computation graph. So you know again we're going to accept some data and run those things, and as part of the feature store, it's automatically storing the data in real-time access and sort of sequential access. So we can essentially feed that data from a Synapse, run those a transformation on it, and it will be stored in different uh, mechanisms in the, the feature store. Uh, and this pipeline can run in the notebook, but it can also run as a scheduled job, as a real-time job, event trigger. So every time we want to retrain our model, we just launch this, or we, we actually set the triggers of when do we want to launch it. So the nice thing is that we describe our pipeline once using some very simple Python tools, and then we can run it in every context we want. And it's actually translating itself to a serverless function that uh, builds this uh, pipeline. So, so what I need to define is a source, and the source is going to be 
Azure, obviously, the, I have to set the Azure credentials as environment variables for that to work. Um, and the first thing I want to do is before I'm ingesting that data into the, the storage and that's going to take over it and IO and all of that, I want to simulate uh, my pipeline. So I'm just doing what we call infer. Infer is essentially running this uh, pipeline in a simulation mode with the real uh, data. And you see that it, essentially we did all this sort of one of encoding and mapping and scaling. So we ended up with having uh, the product being sort of one of encoded and scaled some of the, the values because we want to run some regression algorithm. And this is the result of the, of the data set that we're going to use for uh, the features that we're producing will be used for training. Now, once we've played around with this, we just need to ingest uh, those features into the, um, the feature store. And again, it's going to run ingestion in the background as a job or in the notebook based on your preferences. And, and that's it. And this way, we already have all those features cataloged. So if we go into the feature store, we'll see all those features uh, cataloged. We can go and build vector out of them and so on. But we're going to do that programmatically. So in order to build a feature vector and use it later for training, serving, and other things, uh, first, we're going to define the set of features that uh, are going to be needed for our uh, model training. So you see there is like a a group of features or what we call the feature set and individual feature. And the nice thing, I can use uh, features from many different feature sets, many different groups of features. So I can use features from a stream, features from another data set, features from the uh, logs of the, the web and so on. Uh, we've, we've done a separate session in, on the patient deterioration analysis where we've demonstrated like four different data sets being combined with time traveling all in the same uh, feature vector. So we're building that feature vector, we, we're saving it, and then we're asking the system to get us the feature, the online features that adhere to that sort of feature vector, uh, but we've also told it to save the result of the feature vector in Azure, in Blab Store. So we'll, we'll later on show how we're using it in Azure ML. So the feature store essentially took a, grabbed a bunch of features from Synapse, it's doing all sorts of machine learning transformation on them, scaling, imputing, and so on. And it's storing it back uh, ready in both real time and batch orientation. So that means it's already ready for production. There's no extra work needed, as I'll show you in a minute, to drive it into production. So uh, now if we just want to look at how this vector looks like, this is how the vector uh, example looks like. Uh, again, we can join a lot more features from many different data sources. And in this case, we're just going to run some, uh, you know, some regression algorithm on that and run some training. You see, the only thing I had to do is just run some training, and here we can see the results, and that's it. So taking the data from Synapse, running training on your notebook is really a, a piece of cake. If we want to use Azure ML, because Azure ML since you're going to run a bunch of algorithms for you, all the different permutations, and so on. And then it's not that hard. We need to essentially create an Azure ML uh, job uh, for training. I need to give it a bunch of uh, parameters. Um, we can also launch it as, as an ML run job or uh, just as a job on, uh, on Azure. We just give it the, um, the feature vector is a, is a parameter and run the job and that will essentially go and run in Azure ML and do all the training with all the hyperparameter and all the algorithm selection and all that. So once the Azure ML job finishes, we, we have a model and that model is registered in the model repository. And now we can use the serving function. So the serve fun serving function this time needs to go and get exactly the same feature vector that we defined. Remember, we saved the feature vector. So now we have a, a model uh, classification or regression uh, algorithm that is going to take our model that we just uh, saved and generated in the training, whether it's an auto ML training or just simple training in your notebook. When this uh, model is, is loaded, it's essentially going to um, you know, load the feature vector uh, sort of service into the, the container. It's going to run every time an event arrives to this uh, to this prediction function, it will provide the inputs from the wire, which is essentially the customer ID. And 
and do the prediction based on that. So without doing any extra effort, we also got all the real-time feature engineering uh, ready for, for our use. Um, we can register the different models if we want to even do like ensembles. So we can take a bunch of algorithms and, and build them into uh, an ensemble graph. We can test our model uh, in the notebook to see that it works with essentially with the offline feature uh, data. We can translate it to a list and just drive it in our model. Um, and also uh, we just we can just go and deploy our production uh, pipeline using a single command is deploy, we may want to give it some volume mounts, you know, file system access to, to access the, the model. And if we want it to track all the model activities back into another stream, we just do set tracking, which essentially all the activities of the, the model serving function are logged into a streaming engine. And all that data is, is analyzed for accuracy, for drift, and written back as parquet files into the Azure Data Lake. And there you can actually use data synapse to do things like governance policies or explainability and other analytic tasks on the production data. So this is uh, in general, again, if anyone wants more uh, details, just uh, ping me and we, we can give you sort of a more uh, dedicated demo to your uh, use case. Okay, with that, I've finished my part. Any questions or? Thanks, Yaron. And yes, this is a great time to go into Q&A. So we invite you to ask us any questions that you have uh, in the Q&A panel. And I see that we already have one. So this is for the Microsoft team. Uh, is the Microsoft solution limited to relational data sources? Um. No, absolutely. Um, so you can pick up from uh, any type of sources and um, it doesn't have to be relational. So if the question is related to the connector, we can connect pretty much to almost all the um, existing analytic platform. But it can be even a structured data or taking from um, an API, anything really. Great, that's uh, great news. Um, we have another question for the Microsoft team. What is the difference between Azure Synapse and uh, the Databricks solution? And when should you use which one? So the difference is uh, Synapse as a both um, type of engine. Um, a massive parallel process engine, uh, so a distributed engine for the SQL side, uh, which is the analytic uh, SQL, and then the Spark. And the Spark is based on the Apache Spark, uh, and not in the custom Databricks. Um, so Databricks has a different approach, um, but they do integrate. So ultimately, the best way is always uh, to use uh, what is the best tool for the job? So when we automate pipelines, when you create the pipeline in Synapse, you will be able to call any type of uh, uh, services, including external services, including uh, Azure Databricks. So normally what we see is then when the ETL process is uh, dealing with the massive scale, uh, the preference is to if someone is using Spark, is to use the, uh, the Spark version of Databricks. Excellent, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, we have time. And, for and I think there's also uh, the aspect of sort of um, out of the box and the connectors and all that. So you have all those integrations and you have a drag and drop tool. Not everyone wants to write a notebook to uh, and develop things in PySpark. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the low code or no code experience, that's something that is typical, um, you know, from you know, our side. And so that, that's something that you, you find on, you know, normally on in things like Synapse or other similar product that we have. It's like, for example, Data Factory for, you know, orchestration as a similar approach. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, we do have time for one or two more questions. So 
in model governance, does Azure have a built-in tool to validate model performance or monitoring? So we do on the, the end to hand, uh, there is an element of um, uh, Azure. It depends if you're running in, in Azure machine learning, uh, all the data goes into the um, log analytics and Azure monitor. Um, we do our way, but I suppose that's also part of the integration that you have with, you know, um, things like uh, Ibasio that you can kind of. Yeah, this is part part of the joint solution with uh, with Azure, and uh, when we're using the the serving engine based on uh, on Nucleo, which has like real time pipelines and and all that, it has also built in capabilities for model monitoring, for accuracy, for drift, for data validation policies, and so on. Uh, and you can view those either in a, in a canned uh, you know, UI, which is part of the ML Run uh, open source project, or as part of Grafana dashboards that uh, can, can visualize all this uh, detailed information about the model health, activity, performance, latency, real-time feature values, and, and so on. That's great. Um, and we have uh, someone asking whether they can explore the sample notebooks that you showed earlier, Yaron, themselves. Uh, do you want to so, take the time? Uh, there are some examples in the ML Run uh, uh, documentation site. If you just uh, go um, mlrun.org and, and push the docs, there is uh, an ex not this example, but you can just ping us offline. We'll, we can send you the, the, this version. Excellent. And with that, uh, we are nearing the end of our uh, session today. And before we share the poll results, I just wanted to mention that there are plenty more resources on bringing data science to production on the Iguazio website. On our MLOps page, you can find previous sessions of this webinar series, uh, blogs, videos, and other resources to help you simplify and accelerate your path to production. Uh, in some of these resources, we have experts from uh, Twitter, Netflix, Siemens, NVIDIA, NetApp, S&P Global, and others who are sharing their experience in operationalizing machine learning. So please do check them out and let us know what you think. And now we'll share the poll results. So we'll start with the first poll, which was about uh, what your biggest challenge is around data for AIML. And 27% of you said that standardizing the use of data across the organization is your biggest challenge, followed by unifying different data sets. Um, then some of you are not currently working on AI ML projects. Um, after that was feature engineering and data access. And a good thing, Kate, that we have zero guys saying that they don't have any challenges with data. Absolutely. I love it. So everybody was very honest on this poll, I see. <laughs> Good to know. It's challenging stuff. Yeah, most people argue that most of the problem in machine learning is around data. That's uh, the key point. And we'll go ahead and share the results of the second poll as well. So which part of the ML lifecycle would you most like to automate? Um, it's actually a tie between data preparation and the entire process end-to-end, 27% -end, uh, each, followed by management and production, and then data collection, uh, and then training and deployment. And here again, 0% said none. So very, very interesting <laughs> result. Yeah. And, and Yaron, to your point, see, data is the problem, not the ML, apparently. So this, this poll just proves this is another data point for our collection. Yes. And I think that's because machine learning is becoming more and more understood. You know, there are still a lot of challenges around deep learning that people still have to grasp everything around it. But in machine learning, I think the, you know, the technology is pretty well understood and automated already. Absolutely. Okay, and uh, that brings today's session to a close. So uh, let's continue the conversation in our Slack community. We'll go ahead and share the link in the chat box again now. And at this point, I'd like to thank you so much, Kate, Alessandro, and your own for taking us through this fascinating topic. 
And thanks everyone for joining us. We'll uh, see you next time.